Hey folks, Dave Temple here. As you know, my podcast is all about talking to the best thriller writers in the world. Now, while I don't put myself in that category of the best, I've certainly got my hat now in the ring. And after nearly three years of hosting this podcast, I think it's time to toot my own horn, if you will. So with that, I'm offering my thriller, The Poser, for sale all this month. It stars Detective Pat Norelli, a rookie cop working the overnight beat in Hollywood when one of the town's biggest stars is found dead in her Hollywood Hills home only hours hours after winning an Oscar. Beloved by her fans, Pat thinks someone wants this star dead and sees this as a way to forge her own path and get the promotion she craves. I'm proud of the response I've gotten from fans and I'm confident you're going to like The Poser. So for the rest of this month, you can get the ebook for only five bucks or the paperback for 14. Since I do this weekly podcast as a free service, perhaps you'd consider this as a way to help out a fellow thriller writer. There are two ways to reach the link. First, you can go to David Temple Books. Dot com. Scroll down to see The Poser. Click and you're on your way. Or head over to Amazon. You can find it there. Again, davidtemplebooks.com or Amazon. Thanks in advance for your support. And now, on with the show. Welcome to The Thriller Zone. I'm your host, David Temple. Hard to believe we have now surpassed 100 episodes, but we have, thanks to you. On today's show, I've got a very special guest. She was on the show about 10 months ago, and she had a book called All Her Little Secrets, and I loved it. And I, when I got a chance to bring her back, I thought, it's going to be good. And now, guess what? Wanda Morris has a new book called Anywhere You Run. Well, there's so much to say, I just want to get right to it. So let's join Wanda Morris here on The Thriller Zone. Hello. How are you? I'm so good. You're so beautiful. Oh, you always say that to all your authors that come on. Um, uh, Let's see. I didn't say that to Andrews Wilson. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I can say that because they're pals. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, friend. How are you? I am so good. And uh, I think we should just jump right into it because we have a, a limited time and so much to talk about. But man, it's so good to see you again. You too. It was so great to see you at Thriller Fest back in the summer. Yeah, I was going to say before I slide this little mention in that Anywhere You Run is what we're going to be talking about today. This is Wanda Morris, in case you have been sleeping in a cave somewhere. But yeah, what have you been up to? We saw I saw you at uh, Thriller Fest back in the summer, and I, I don't know who lit up bigger, you or me, because I was as happy to see you, I think, as you were to see me. <laughs> Same. Exactly. Exactly. It has been a busy time at the time we saw each other. I think that was back in June, right? Yes. Um. I was busy um, putting the final touches on Anywhere You Run. So um, I was kind of spread thin a little bit, if <laughs> you will. Um, but it was it was a good time. Thriller Fest is always a good time. So, um, so yeah. You didn't show any nerves or any. Now, you were sitting at the big table. You know, folks, by the way, the uh, Wanda <laughs> got to sit at the big table. And I sat at the kids' table in the back. Um, because they said, we know you, David, and you're a bad, um, you act up during dinner. So you're going to sit you're back here. So funny. You are so funny. Yeah, it was, a, it was a good time. That was the um, debut author's um, breakfast. And so um, Thriller Fest has this really great, I have to slip into my uh, commercial moment here because I'm on the board of Thriller Fest. So I always like to, you know, give them a shout out. Um, but yeah, they they have this wonderful program for debut authors and spotlighting debut authors um, during their the year their book comes out is is one of the things one of the many things that they do for newly published authors. And so yeah, I was a part of that, and um, and that was great fun. A little scary to be in front of so many people, but it was really fun. 
Yeah, well, first of all, it didn't show that you were that you were scared. And I think those are just standard stage nerves. But look at all the love and attention you got. Everyone was there. It was like, whoa, they were so <laughs> cheering you on. And that's got to feel good. I mean, you've become, um, let's say, um, a little bit of a superstar. I mean, you're getting a lot of attention. Oh, I don't know. I just took the garbage out this morning. <laughs> so, hmm. and after I took the garbage out, I realized that there was still a pizza box sitting on the cabinet that my son neglected to put in the garbage. So yeah, the, the beautiful life of a superstar writer. That's me folks. Hey, uh, not to be, uh, you know, Jimmy parent here, but uh, shouldn't the son be taking some of those responsibilities from mom? Yeah, that was his responsibility. That's exactly right. That's why I said he left the pizza box. Um, so he was supposed to take the garbage out this morning before he left for school and did not. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I need yeah. to get on top of that this afternoon when he comes home. I was having a conversation with some friends over the weekend. We were talking about discipline today in the in the 2020s versus when I grew up. Well, I was born in 59, so in that early 60s. And we were talking about the advantages of, uh, how shall we say, certain forms of discipline. And <laughs> it started early on, Wanda, with me. My dad, all he had to do was to reach like he was going to grab his belt. You know, because back in those days, we got a whipping and we straightened up. Here's the beautiful thing. With time, all it took was this. That's right. The look. It That's was that right. look. He'd come, look. Home from, come home from work and, and mom would say, oh, David's been up to <laughs> And I'd say, Dad, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm going to take my own uh, discipline here into my own hands. I'm going to ground myself for a week. <laughs> you know? Well, not to be a show off, but I was that kid that never got a whipping. I, yeah, I, I, I did not. Now my older brothers did. Um, I am the last of seven. So maybe my parents were just tired by the time. <laughs> um, but, but no, I really did. But I did get the look and I usually got it in church from my mom because I was usually talking. I was a talker. And, you know, all she had to do was just look down the pew. And I was like, OK, so I did get the look. But no, I never I I never got a spanking. Well, so. that's because you were the perfect child. OK, go yeah, ahead there. So bad. I don't know no, I think I think you're right. The folks were uh, oh, just she'll figure it out. I'm exhausted. Yeah. <laughs> Same thing happened to my younger sister, who was the last of four. And and the folks were just like, oh, if you haven't figured it out by now, you just you will. You know? I was like, right. Right. wait a minute. To you. <laughs> you used to beat me within an inch of my life. In love, of course. Of love. Of course. It, it always came from love. Of course. Yeah. Well, I do want to... Um, there's so many good, there's so many things I want to say about uh, anywhere you run. Uh, and first of all, let me back up a second. It, I was doing a little research 10 months ago, this week ish, you were here talking about um, um, all her little secrets, which I loved. And yes. I thought, well, she's not going to be able to top that, but I think, <laughs> I think, I think you've topped it. <laughs> it's a different kind of story. So don't get me wrong. Thank uh, you. But, Oh, all right, there's 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 some good and there's some bad, right? Let me let me get on the good. First of all, um, I love the dual perspective. Um, love that from the two sisters. And you'd think, well, first of all, I want to say these things and let you bask in that so that I don't step all over top of you. <laughs> you are so funny. <laughs> thank you, but yeah. thank you very much for the compliment. There's so many things I liked about, I love following their perspectives and you get that right out of the gate. So you get inside of one sister's head and then you get inside the others. And, um, you know, it's not a brand new technique, but boy, talking about the perfect place to use it was this story. So I want to say that the book was alarming. It was powerful, um, all for all the right reasons. 
The only thing that bothered me, uh, not to get too much on my soapbox, but it's the one thing that continues to haunt this country and is discrimination and hatred and that it has disturbed me since I was a kid. I I never understood it. Uh, I grew up in a preacher's home, so I probably had a little extra influence of, you know, treat your neighbors right across the board. But and having grown up in the South, I, I saw it all around me. Um, like I said, 59. And, but to this day, uh, to this day, and I, and my, I was talking to Tammy the other day. I'm like, it, it bothers me every day. It, you know, it practically, it, it breaks my heart is what it does. Yeah. Yeah. It's unfortunate. I wrote a fictional story that takes place in 1964 and the parallels between 1964 and 2022 are stark and sadly um, real. Yeah. Um, a lot of the things that I explored in this book are still occurring today. And what's even um, really funny is, of course, um, this book, again, um, touches on a woman's right to govern her own body, um, just as my first book did. And at the time that I wrote the book and I turned it in, the Roe v. Wade um, reversal decision from the Supreme Court had not come down yet. And so uh, I was talking with my daughter a couple months ago, and I said, you know, it's really, really sad to think that my daughter is in her 20s. And I said, it's really sad to think that I had more rights as a woman when I was your age than you do right now. And we are sitting in the 21st century. Um, it, it is hauntingly sad, uh, the parallels that occur in 1964 and what is occurring right now. And particularly when you look at voting rights. Yeah. And we could go down uh, a, uh, painful hole, uh, but I don't want this show to be that. Cause I want to talk about the, 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 the upside of all of this and, you know, your beautiful writing, but yeah, um, y- you just said something that just really stopped me in my tracks. And that is, uh, and, and not to be, you know, captain obvious, but how sad is that? The fact that you're sitting here going, honey, <laughs> right, right. I had it better. I I never would have imagined the day my daughter was born that we would have a conversation like that. Um, But yeah, indeed. Okay. Well, I would love to know um, where, I don't want to say where this story came from, but because there's so many great influences and so many nice little lessons. Yeah. There's a lot of tragedy (laughs) and some people did some bad things. So, Come on, David. You know me. I'm always <laughs> writing a happy unicorn rainbow yeah. lollipop books, right? <laughs> what you did at the end with the the gaggle of kittens was so beautiful. I mean, the way they all just came together in the end and that rainbow. Of the I mean, it was just perfect. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. You know, it's funny. I, um, I had just finished up All Her Little Secrets and turned that book in to my publisher And I was looking around for um, another, you know, topic to write about. And we had just come through the 2020 election. And I thought, oh, that would be really interesting to explore that. But I couldn't really figure out a contemporary angle to to the story. And um, as you know, I'm a lawyer. And my practice is primarily in employment law, civil rights law. And I thought, oh, maybe I could look back to look forward. And I decided, yeah, maybe I'll explore the voting rights and how that all came about. So originally the story was going to be set in 1965 because that was the year that the Voting Rights Act was um, passed. But um, as I started to research um, for the book, I learned that so much of what went into the passage of the Voting Rights Act really occurred years before, and particularly in 1964. 
uh, Megger Evers and all his work for, you know, voting rights in Mississippi, his assassination. So I thought maybe I need to step back a year and then just explore it from a bigger perspective, particularly um, 1964 was the year that the Civil Rights Act was passed. And that's the law that gives everybody equal access to public facilities, right. uh, regardless of race. And that's the law under which my legal practice um, stems out of. Um, civil rights law and employment law all kind of stem from the Civil Rights Act of 1964. So it was kind of a neat little full circle kind of moment to take the book back to that year and and start the story there. Yeah. I also enjoyed uh, how you, you, you know, there's a certain rhythm that you will find with a good writer and there'll be a rhythm which lets you know, it telegraphs in a very subconscious way where and how the story is moving. And you're like, oh yeah, okay, I got this. I know where we're going, blah, blah, blah. But then I love it when you throw those little things, well, wait, wait, wait a minute, We there was a fork in the road. I would thought I was going that way. We went that way. And, and you did that with characters and... Um, one of the primary bad dudes. And uh, yeah, I enjoyed that. Yeah. Yeah. But you know what? I remember when my husband um, read the book, I, I don't really like to let my family read my work. As you know, I wrote all the little secrets in secret, yes. um, but my husband said, Oh, you have to let me read. The first one was so good and I had to beg for it. So you have to let me read it. So it was like, okay. And he read um, a draft of the book. <laughs> so we went out for a walk one day and I was like, well, because, you know, the people that I love, the people that I care about, their opinion matters to me. Sure. He says, yeah, that book was another home run. He said, and I got to tell you, I had mixed emotions about the villain in the story. Yeah. And I was like, oh. And I thought that was a really good sign because everybody in the book, all the characters, nobody is all good and nobody is all bad, um, including the villain. So um, I thought, oh, that's that's nice. Um, so I hope people kind of walk away with a perspective of, hmm, wait a minute, that was interesting. And the, the motivations that the characters had for doing the things that they did in the story. Well, that's what pulled me along was the fact that it's so reflective of what reality is. We are, we do have light and dark in us, right? We do have that bright side and that exterior presentation do we make to people. But a lot of people don't know what that dark side is that bubbles up underneath and that is probably closer to the surface and ready to burst at any moment and would be surprised to find when some of us did meet uh match that breaking point what would happen and i i, I dig that yeah yeah exactly exactly because if you didn't if you if, if they were all um one-sided one you know uh, um non-multifaceted singularly faceted it'd be kind of a boring read but you made it interesting by stirring that pot and going, because here's why. So-and-so did bad. Well, that's terrible. Shouldn't have done that. But you would cause us to go, but do you see some of the motivation behind that? And there's a little bit of reasoning that makes sense to me. Yeah, exactly. And I also want people to understand that this horrific umbrella of racism not only captures blacks and people of color under it, it also captures whites and disenfranchised whites in particular. And they too become pawns in a really, really horrible, um, in, in this particular case of the book, this, this horrible segregationist system. Um, and so again, it, it is to explore the much larger theme of um, how racism impacts everybody, black and white. Disenfranchised, that's a great word and a great representation of what uh, all layers of the book is about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
What was, and this is a real pointed question, but I know you'll rise to the occasion because you're so well-spoken. What was the hardest part of writing this book? Oh, it was probably, most specifically, it was that opening scene. Oh my God. I almost, can I interrupt you a second? Wanda, I apologize, but when I started this book, I literally, I told Tammy this. She came in the room when I was finishing the first, getting ready to turn the page. And she goes, what do you think about the book? I said, I, I don't think I can read it. It affected mm -hmm. me that badly, that yeah. strongly. Yeah. Um, but I'm sorry, I apologize, but go on. No, thank you. I consider that, uh, I consider that high praise. That, um that was particularly difficult um, and particularly the research behind it because um, there really were photos from that incident. Um, and I, I have to stop and give a shout out to the Auburn Avenue Research Library on African-American history and culture. They are part of the, uh, the um, Fulton County um, uh, library system here in Atlanta. And when I decided what I was going to write about. I walked in there and I told the librarian what I wanted to to look at and, and what I needed. And, you know, I was kind of like, I don't know where to start. And he said, I got you. And um, he just opened up, you know, a treasure trove of papers and books and, you know, magazines. And, um, and so some of that research was really, really difficult. Uh, reading firsthand accounts of people who were beaten um, or lynched because they were just simply trying to secure the right to vote, what the constitution gives all of us. Um, so I'd say that those were the more difficult parts. Um, and I think also from a craft standpoint, I wanted to make sure that the voices were distinct because the book is done in multiple POV. I wanted to make sure that when you were reading the story, you knew which sister was talking or you knew which point of view you were in. Um, so, yeah, so I, I think those were the things that I I challenged myself to do. As I often say, mission accomplished, because you do make it very easy to recall and understand who's doing the talking, as well as the characters inside each scene who share scenes and the perspective they're in. Uh, so I can understand that a lot of the hardest part of the story and <clears throat> doing that research, I, I can't imagine what you went through because you have to just relive some of the history that we have to relive. And that yeah. opening scene is so powerful. And it's so funny, uh, Wanda, because again, this was 60, was it, it's 64. So yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, mm -hmm. I'm what, five years old. So when I'm hearing these folks talk, those are the voices I grew up hearing. You know, mm. uh, sadly, some of those voices, not, of course, all of it. I wasn't deeply immersed in deep South, but, you know, North Carolina's South enough. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> but some of those people to this day, I just go, man, you are so out of touch. Yeah, Th those. Yeah, those voices are still around. Those yeah. voices are still around because uh, a child isn't born to be a racist. A child is taught to be a racist. So exactly. there are. There are people who are whispering in their ears. Yeah. <laughs> and sometimes not so much of a whisper. Right. Let's, let's flip that on its top and say, what was your favorite part? What was one of the, the lighter uh, results of this book? And, and we'll, I'm going to break it down one step further. But, you know, what did you walk away going? Oh, I'm so glad I did it because of this. Oh, gosh. I think it would have to be just exploring what it was like to live as a black woman in the 60s and there were certainly dark periods of time but that resolve and that strength to persevere you know every day to get up put one foot in front of the other and keep doing what you needed to do i thought yeah that is something that needs to be told particularly in this day and age when you hear all these terms thrown around about critical race theory and you know all this nonsense um and i think just from a craft standpoint writing those lighter scenes um where i explore black love i mean violet and hank 
my God. I, yeah. I love Hank. I love Violet. Um, the, the, the party where they, you know, kind of move the rug out of the, you know, living room floor and everybody is having a good time, regardless of who they are. Um, you know, there's a character in the story um, who's gay and, you know, she's accepted for who she is. And so I enjoy bringing those kinds of characters into a story, particularly a story of 1964 exactly. South. Um, so, yeah, those were some of the things that I enjoyed. Well, folks, the story is deep. It's rich. We're going to take a short break. When we come back, we're going to find out uh, what some of the biggest response has been to this book as it uh, pertains to the lovely and talented Wanda Morris of Staples. We'll be right back. Your host, David Temple here. Hey, before we get back to the show, I thought I would throw in this one quick note. I have had authors approach me who want to actually advertise on the show. And I'm like, that's cool. I love that idea. I mean, think about it. We feature the best thriller writers in the world. You're one of the new up and coming thriller writers in the world to be. And you have a book coming out. Our rates are super reasonable. We're easy to work with, as you know, and we all want to work together to make success for all of us. Just reach out to us here at The Thriller Zone at thethrillerzone at gmail.com. Let's talk rates. Let's talk details. Let's do something together in the new year. I think you'll like it. Now, back to the show. Welcome back to The Thriller Zone. From Wanda M. Morris's latest thriller, Anywhere You Run, it's time for If This Scene Could Talk. Mercer Bugs had worked around the Leonard Feed and Supply Company off and on for five years before the owner's son, Dewey Leonard, even spoke to him for the first time. Mercer could smell his kind a mile away. A big toothy grin, a hearty handshake and a slap on the back usually opened doors for guys like Dewey. Mercer figured it was all the elder Mr. Leonard's wealth and the junior Leonard's fancy college education up north that pumped Dewey full of bluster and made the Leonard's look down on people like him. In fact, Mercer did a double take as he watched Dewey drive up to the front of Mercer's trailer in the Oak Tree Mobile Park Village. A few kids played marbles in the dirt nearby. An old lady ambled about, hanging laundry on a line strung from the side of her trailer to a post planted in the dirt ten feet out. The siding on Mercer's trailer had started to rust along the bottom, and still his trailer was one of the better-looking ones in the whole trailer park. Mercer dreamed of the day he could move his wife and kid into a real house, something solid and connected to the ground. By his estimate, they were living about as bad as the coloreds on the other side of town. Dewey's brand new Bonneville convertible, a birthday gift from his daddy, stuck out like a parish priest in the middle of a whorehouse. Mercer noticed a couple neighbors stop talking mid-sentence to admire Dewey's new toy. Dewey eased the car to a stop and smiled up at Mercer, not a word between them. The car outright gleamed against Mercer's busted-up old gray Ford Fairlane. When Mercer failed to comment on the Bonneville, Dewey slipped out of the car and closed the door. He strutted up to Mercer, his face all lit up with the afternoon sun. He threw his head back, tossing a lock of hair. Hey, Mercer, how you been? This greeting was a first, because Dewey never called Mercer by his first name. It was always Bugaboo or Bugsy, like calling a man out of his name was some sort of joke to him. Dewey... Mercer said, civil but guarded. Mercer slid his hand across the top of his dark hair, wrestling with an oily cowlick that always gave him a disheveled appearance. I ain't seen you around the supply yard in a month of Sundays. Dewey ramped up his southern accent as if it would build some sort of bond between the two of them. I've been busy. Yeah, Daddy told me about your kid, Rusty. Randy. Yeah, little Randy. Been under the weather off and on, huh? Sorry to hear about that. Thanks. Mercer was patient, but he knew Dewey was up to something. He hadn't driven this far out to chat about Randy being sick. He wanted something. Ever since Mercer had gotten into that fight at Raleigh's Roadhouse with a mayor's son, the Leonards had all but abandoned him. 
Dewey's father told him not to come around the feed store, and Dewey pretended like Mercer was invisible. The craziest part is that Mercer only got into that fight because the mayor's son said something disparaging about the Leonards, although he no longer remembered the comment. Mercer promised his wife he was finished with Dewey and the whole Leonard family. Daddy and the guys have missed you. Dewey quickly realized the error of his statement and tried to clean things up. Well, me too, of, of course. I, I don't hang around there much these days. I'm trying to set off on my own, you know, start my own business. That right, Mercer said flatly. Get on with it, he thought. Dewey slipped his hands into his pants pocket. Look, you mind if we talk for a minute? And we're talking now. <laughs> okay. Okay, so I'll just come right out to the point. I was thinking you could handle something for me. Something outside my daddy's business, that is. What's that? Mercer felt his left eye twitch. Dewey casually leaned against his Bonneville, folded his arms across his chest, and crossed his ankles. He made a big production of it, like, like it might make Mercer think better of him. I need you to find somebody for me. Hmm, who? Dewey glanced around the trailer park before he turned back to Mercer. A woman? I'm trying to find a woman. Uh, I remember how you sniffed out that fellow who tried to get away with my daddy's feed from the store. Daddy still talks about how you found that guy without a hitch. <laughs> Said you got the nose of a bloodhound. Dewey chuckled, thinking the compliment might lighten things between them. Mercer took a couple steps closer, narrowing the gap between them. Cautious, Mary Lou might come from inside the trailer at any minute and spot them. Wondering as much as he was why Dewey Leonard was in their front yard asking Mercer to find a woman. Who's a woman? Dewey smiled again. Well, before we get into all that, I, I need to know whether I can trust you. Who's a woman? Dewey was smart enough to know he wasn't working for the Leonards now. He didn't have to be respectful if he didn't want to. Dewey hesitated for a beat. Violet Richards. You know her? Mercer shook his head. He knew just about everybody in Jackson, even a few of the coloreds on the other side of town. Where is she? Well, see, that's what I need you to find out, uh, Mercer, buddy. An old lunker of an Edsel rambled past them and through the park. Both men stopped talking and watched the car pass. Why are you looking for this woman? Dewey hesitated. Mercer picked up on it instantly. Ah, it's between her and me. I just, I just really need to find her. So, can I count on you? Mercer thought it through for a few seconds. Dewey Leonard and some woman. It sounded like trouble. Big trouble. Oh, my kid's sick. I need to stay close to home. I, I'm not interested. I can pay you a thousand dollars, plus any expenses you might have to lay out on top of that. And that was more money than Mercer had ever seen in his entire life. Seems to me you must really want to find this woman. What I need is somebody who can keep all this under his hat, too. You see, my business with this woman is just between me and her. Mercer gave a long, unblinking stare at him before he nodded his chin at Dewey's car. I oh, see so you got a new car. Eight lug aluminum wheels, huh? Dewey stood up from his leaning posture and peered down to the car, then back at Mercer. I imagine a thousand dollars will go a long way with a sick kid and all. Dewey was right. The money would go a long way. But it came with trouble if it was coming from the Leonards. Mercer finally decided if he's going to take their money and their trouble, he ought to make it worth his while. Mm -hmm. Twenty-five hundred will go a lot further. Dewey smiled. <laughs> My daddy always said you were a cunning one. Mercer smiled back. Nice talking to you, Dewey. Nice car, too. He eased away and pulled the handle on the squeaky door to his house. I gotta get going. Mary Lou's making dinner inside. Wait! Hold on now. Dewey stared at Mercer for a beat. Twenty-five hundred. Plus expenses. Plus expenses. What'd you need me to do? Violet Richards is a colored woman. Last time I saw her was in Birmingham. Dewey pulled an envelope from his back pants pocket. He slid out a small photo and handed it to Mercer. Mercer stared down at the black and white shot of Dewey, his arm wrapped around a tall, attractive colored woman with long, dark hair. The couple leaned against Dewey's new car. She was different, this one. Her mouth seemed a perfect little bow with lipstick. She offered up the kind of smile and figure that probably got her all sorts of attention in the right setting. 
Mercer didn't find colored women attractive, but there was something about this woman. Something about her eyes. Or maybe it was that lipstick little bow of a mouth that could draw a man in. Her dress on the back of the picture, she lives over on Oakland Avenue, has a sister named Marigold. You might want to start there. But can I count on you to keep this between me and you? Wait a minute. Violet Richards. Ain't this the woman the police are looking for? Think she might have killed Huxley Broadus? Yeah, but I need to get to her before they do. Mercer stared at the picture, then gave a long, quiet glare at Dewey. Why you need me to find a colored gal so bad? Like I said, that's between me and her. You just find her for me, all right? I need half the money now. That's not a problem. I'll be back with it this evening. We got a deal. Dewey grinned and stuck out his hand like there were a couple of horse traders sealing the deal. Mercer hated this rich college boy, but he loved Mary Lou and Randy more than he hated Dewey. He hadn't worked a steady job in months, and they had a kitchen table full of bills. He needed the money. Mercer took a deep breath and reluctantly shook Dewey's hand. <clears throat> what makes you so sure I can find this gal? My daddy always told me you were like a pit bull on a bone. One of the best workers he ever hired. I appreciate you helping me out like this, buddy. Now, this is just between us. Mercer nodded his agreement. Dewey's father was right. Mercer bugs with dogged when he wanted something, and right now he wanted, needed, that $2,500. Dewey headed for the car, then stopped in his tracks and turned back to Mercer. Oh, there's just one more thing. A menacing grin slicked across Dewey's face. When you find her, don't lay a hand on her. Just let me know where she is. I'll take care of the rest. And we are back. Welcome to the Thriller Zone. I'm your host, David Temple. This is the lovely and talented Wanda Morris. The book is Anywhere You Run. Take a moment. Take a moment to bask in the beauty of the cover and the beauty of this gal and in a story that is powerful. And I can say, and I, I'm, I try not to be melodramatic. You don't see me as being melodramatic, right? Not at all, David, okay. not at all. <laughs> but it has haunted me it, it, because of the subject matter that is all too prevalent today. Mm -hmm. uh, it haunts me. However, the hope of the story blesses me. So there you go. Oh, thank you. There's a couple things I want to talk about. Uh, we're going to get to some reviews in a second, but first I want to say what has, uh, let's, let's start with the positive because we're, we'll get to the other in a second. Always start with the positive. <laughs> yeah. What's been the biggest response? Because I've seen, I've seen some quotes. Uh, I know that uh, Hank Philby Ryan is a huge fan of yours. And I love her. She is such a sweetheart. She, I adore her. She's a rock star. So let's let, let me shut up and let you be telling me about all the good stuff that's happening. Oh gosh, I you know I got to tell you, David, I'm a little blown away. People have been so kind and so generous in their praise for the book, and um, yeah, there've been several quotes. I think um, there's a quote on the front, maybe on the finished copy from Lou Burney that I just. Um, Gosh, I love Lou Burney. Um, Who doesn't? Writing, right. His writing is just phenomenal. And he's one of the most gracious human beings ever um, next to you. And, um, you know, him, Rachel Housel Hall. I mean, just so many wonderful, wonderful writers have rallied around this book. And then um, the, the larger, you know, writing trades have you know, given it starred reviews, Publishers Weekly, uh, Booklist, and Library Journal have all given it starred reviews. I, you know, I, I sometimes wake up and I have to pinch myself like, this is really happening. Yeah, really. Well, for those of us who followed you from the start, which is only uh, two, you know, one, <laughs> two books ago, uh, knew that knew that you were going to have this kind of success. It's you're you're too smart. You're too savvy. You're smart and you're savvy, and you love it. I mean, this is your passion. So I have a very long, heartfelt belief. Without getting too spiritual, but 
you're going to you're going to find the desires of your heart if the desires are in your heart and they are true and you lift them up every day you yeah. will find them yeah i i couldn't agree more i couldn't agree more um i'm blessed I have this. I'm going to get real preachy on you. We're going to church now, people. I want you to grab your hymnals. My, I can do that because my dad was a preacher, as I told you. But I always had this thought that, uh, and again, not to get too spiritual on it, but if they, you know, there, I think there's a scripture in the Bible that says something about, uh, and he, God, the powerful universe, however you want to see it, I got no problems with any of it. Uh, will give you the desires of your heart. And mm -hmm. I always thought, I used to say to my dad, hey, dad, how wicked would it be if God says, hey, I'm going to give you the desires of your heart, and then you chase those desires, and then you don't find success? Mm -hmm. Is that going, is that God going, oh, psych? You know, I'm like, <laughs> not that kind of a God, I don't think. Um, if you have them, and they live in you, and you want it, you're probably going to get it. Yeah, yeah. I, you know this from our conversation, uh, talking about the last book, I am a woman of faith. And I do believe that what God has for me is for me. And that, you know, if I lean into it and I follow his direction, that all that he has for me is coming for me. And so um, I... I think that's why I I live in the moment with this because first of all I I didn't listen to to his will. I I was so busy chasing after something else when I knew deep deep down in my heart I really really wanted to write books. But I kept making excuses and saying no, I have this to do and that to do. And so when I finally did decide, you know what, I'm going to just stop. I'm going to get off this carousel, the spinning much too fast. I was, you know, in this really high pressure job and doing all these things and being everything to everybody else. And when I stopped and said, what is it that I really want to do? And it was this thing. And I leaned into that. Then I discovered, oh, my gosh, this is everything I've always wanted. And it far exceeds it. I, I never, ever, ever could have imagined that, you know, my book would have taken off. I just simply wanted to get my stories between the covers of a book. Yeah. Um, and so again, you know, like you say, now I'm, you know, probably getting a little too woo woo for folks, but I really do believe that God has something for each of us. And it's just us taking the time to listen and be still enough to hear. Yeah, that's so good. A couple of quick things. I'm going to cut this out, by the way. Um, <clears throat> I only have about seven minutes left um, on this program because I'm shifting uh, um recording platforms and I didn't get the information to you soon enough. So I'm going, um, this is going to end here in about seven minutes. So mm -hmm. just want you to know, um, I do want to say this, <clears throat> that you mentioned, uh, as we were in break about something, uh, about uh, some three stars review. Okay. Now, first of all, my heart's going to be broken about that, but go ahead and lay it on me. What, what happened? Put it on my uh, shoulder right here. Yeah. Like I said, um, uh, publishers weekly, Book list and library journal all gave it star reviews. Um, so that's, um, I mean, think about it library journal, librarians read all the books. Okay. Yeah. So I have always loved librarians and libraries. And so when they say, we like your book, I listen to them. <laughs> Uh, there's going to be haters. There's going to be people who love to rain on your parade. And to those people, I usually say, you're just not really that happy. So run along. <laughs> yeah, there are those people. Um, and again, they are not my focus because as Violet says, in anywhere you run, what people think about me is none of my business. Oh my God. I love when I read that, I was like, my mom used to say that all the time. What you I think about too. me? Yeah. <laughs> Ain't none of my business. Right? She'd just say, move along. 
She my was, mom said that too. Oh my <laughs> gosh, she could not be so bothered. So yeah, yeah, that you know, I just try to make sure that I keep this space that I use for creativity and writing um, positive. And yeah. so that kind of negative, I just try not to let into my space. Control the things you can control and let go of the things that you can't. Exactly. So exactly. much great stuff here today. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I just want to begin to close by saying your voice is so beautiful. And I don't mean just your verbal voice, but your your written voice. And it's so powerful and it's so recognizable. And it it makes me certain that we'll be listening and reading more Wanda Morris for decades to come. Thank you, David. Thank you so much, my friend. Yes. Now, I do want to close with your best piece of writing advice, because you have been there with me from the beginning, and I've been there with you from the beginning, and I'm going to go all the distance with you. So I know you've learned a lot in the last 24 months. So if you were talking to my writers and readers who listen to this show, what's your best piece of writing advice? I have two. One is to read as much as you can, because reading makes you a better writer. You you learn to hear the cadence in the written word and you learn to discern what is good writing or, you know, quote unquote, good writing. Um, the other piece of advice is write the book that you want to read. And that's not novel. That's, you know, Toni Morrison. Sure. Um, but that has always rambled around in the back of my head. And that's what I did with all her little secrets. I couldn't find that book on the shelves. So I decided to write it. Best piece of writing advice ever. Exactly. Toni was you, brilliant. Yeah, you are too. <laughs> Folks, to learn more, visit WandaMorrisWrites.com. You can also follow her on Instagram, as I do, at w Wanda Morris Writes. And once again, the book, Anywhere You Run, such a lovely, powerful, beautiful, poignant read. And I wish you humongous success. Thank you so much, David. I appreciate that. Oh, oh, let's squeeze this in real quick. What is in the offing horizon for 2023? Oh, I am currently working on a contemporary novel about a young woman who has to overcome her own personal insecurities uh, to help a Black landowner um, save his land in southern coastal Georgia. Um, when she discovers um, an illegal scheme that takes away land from disenfranchised and Black landowners. Stir that pot, girl. <laughs> <laughs> Stir it up. <laughs> Good for you. And you know what? One of these days, I know you're going to whip out a little rom-com that's going to blow us all away. <laughs> I keep telling my agent, one of these days, I've got to write a happy little book. <laughs> Trust me, it's in there. Look, you just meet your face and you know it's in there. So I, I don't I don't worry about it. It's coming. I, I, it is always a joy. Thanks so much, my friend. Yes, yes, yes. Tammy's going to love seeing this one. She goes, I love her energy. I'm like, oh, you ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> and ah. tell Tammy I said hello. I'll you do guys it. take care. Thank Bye -bye. you. One of the most delightful gals walking the planet, right? Wanda Morris, her book is Anywhere You Run. Just a powerful book. Get a chance to read it. Do it. It drops on the 25th. All right. As I said at the beginning of the show, hard to believe we've passed 100. Seems like just yesterday we were talking to Andrew Child. 100. And I want to say thank you for joining me. And let's make another 100. What do you say? We're going to kick off November, the 3rd to be exact. When this young fella, Joe Kenda, comes to the Thriller Zone, Killer Triggers. You may have seen Joe on the ID Discovery television show. Well, he's kind of a TV star. He's kind of a big deal. And we're really excited to branch out into some true crime and talk to Joe about his book, Killer Triggers. And I got to tell you something. What's really cool, you feel like you're sitting down with a buddy at a pub just hearing stories. Really funny uh, kind of a read, especially when you're dealing with such, you know, dark stories. Anyway, please make plans to attend next week, November 3rd, as we kick off yet another month of the Thriller Zone. I'm David Temple, your host, and I'll see you then. Make it a good week. Got a lot of reading to do. See you next time on the Thriller Zone.
Oh, oh, oh.